Mr. McCoy back with the 14th part of The Borrowers. Mrs. Driver pushed the boy into the schoolroom and locked the door, and he heard the boards of the passage creak beneath her tread. As satisfied, she moved away. He crept into bed then, because he was cold, and cried his heart out under the blankets. And that, said Mrs. May, laying down her crochet hook, is really the end. Kate stared at her. Oh, it can't be, she gasped. Oh, please, please. The last square, said Mrs. May, smoothing it out on her knee. The hundred and fiftieth. Now we can sew them together. Oh, said Kate, breathing again. The quilt. I thought you meant the story. It's the end of the story, too, said Mrs. May absently. Or the beginning. He never saw them again. And she began to sort out the squares. But, stammered Kate, you can't... I mean, it's not fair, she cried. It's cheating. It's... Tears sprang to her eyes. She threw her work down on the table and her crochet hook after it, and she kicked the bag of wools which lay beside her on the carpet. Why, Kate? Why? Mrs. May looked genuinely surprised. Something more must have happened, cried Kate angrily. What about the rat catcher and the policeman and the... But something more did happen said Mrs. May. A lot more happened. I'm going to tell you. Before Mrs. May tells Kate what happened, what do you think happened to the borrowers when last we left them in part 13? And what do you think is going to happen next? Share with your fellow listeners. Then, why did you say it was the end? Because, said Mrs. May, she still looked surprised. He never saw them again. Then how can there be more? Because, said Mrs. May, there is more. A lot more. Kate glared at her. All right, she said. Go on. Mrs. May looked back at her. Kate, she said after a moment, stories never really end. They can go on and on and on. It's just that sometimes, at a certain point, one stops telling them. But not at this kind of point, said Kate. Well, thread your needle, said Mrs. May, with gray wool this time, and we'll sew these squares together. I'll start at the top, and you can start at the bottom. First, a gray square, then an emerald, then a pink, and so on. Then you didn't really mean it, said Kate, irritably, trying to push the folded wool through the narrow eye of the needle, when you said he never saw them again. But I did mean it, said Mrs. May. I'm telling you just what happened. He had to leave suddenly at the end of the week because there was a boat for India and a family who could take him. And for the three days before he left, they kept him locked up in those two rooms. For three days? exclaimed Kate. Yes, Mrs. Driver, it seemed, told Aunt Sophie that he had a cold. She was determined, you see, to keep him out of the way until she got rid of the borrowers. And did she? asked Kate. I mean, did they all come? The policeman and the rat catcher and the... The sanitary inspector didn't come, at least not while my brother was there. And they didn't have the rat catcher from the town hall, but they had the local man. The policeman came. Mrs. Dr Mrs. May laughed. During those three days, Mrs. Driver used to give my brother a running commentary on what was going on below. She loved to grumble, and my brother, rendered harmless and shut away upstairs, became a kind of neutral. She used to bring his meals up and... On that first morning, she brought all the doll's furniture up on the breakfast tray and made my brother climb the shelves and put it back in the doll's house. It was then she told him about the policeman. Furious, he said she was. Why? asked Kate. Because the policeman turned out to be Nellie Runacre's son, Ernie, a boy Mrs. Driver had chased many a time for stealing russet apples from the tree by the gate. <laughs> 
A nasty, thieving, good-for-nothing, dribbit of no good, she told my brother. Sitting down there he is now in the kitchen, large as life with his notebook out, laughing fit to bust. Twenty-one, he says he is now, and as cheeky as you make him. And was he? asked Kate, round-eyed. A dribbit of no good? Of course not, any more than my brother was. Ernie Runnaker was a fine, upstanding young man and a credit to the police force. And he did not actually laugh at Mrs. Driver when she told him her story, but he gave her what Cramphorl spoke of afterward as an old-fashioned look when she described homily in bed. Take more water with it, it seemed to say. More water with what? asked Kate. The fine old pale Madeira, I suppose, said Mrs. May, and Great Aunt Sophie had the same suspicion. She was furious when she heard that Mrs. Driver had seen several little people when she herself on a full decanter had only risen to one, or at most two. Crampferl had to bring all the Madeira up from the cellar and stack the cases against the wall in a corner of Aunt Sophie's bedroom where, as she said, she could keep an eye on it. Did they get a cat? asked Kate. Yes, they did, but that wasn't much of a success either. It was Crampferl's cat, a large yellow tom with white streaks in it. According to Mrs. Driver, it had only two ideas in its head to get out of the house or into the larder. Talk of borrowers, Mrs. Driver would say as she slammed down the fish pie for my brother's luncheon. That cat's a borrower, if ever there was one. Borrowed the fish, that cat did, and a good half bowl of egg sauce. But the cat wasn't there long. The first thing the rat catcher's terriers did was to chase it out of the house. There was a dreadful set to, my brother said. They chased it everywhere, upstairs and downstairs, in and out of the rooms, barking their heads off. The last glimpse my brother had of the cat was streaking away through the spinney and across the fields with the terriers after it. Did they catch it? No, Mrs. May laughed. It was still there when I went a year later, a little morose, but as fit as a fiddle. Tell me about when you went. Oh, I wasn't here long. I wasn't there long, said Mrs. May rather hastily. And after that house was sold, my brother never went back. Kate stared at her suspiciously, pressing her needle against the center of her lower lip. So, they never caught the little people, she said at last. Mrs. May's eyes flicked away. No, they never actually caught them, but... She hesitated. As far as my poor brother was concerned, what they did do seemed even worse. What did they do? So what do you think they did to the borrowers in order to answer Kate's question? Share what you think with your fellow listener. Mrs. May laid down her work and stared for a moment thoughtfully at her idle hands. I hated the rat catcher, she said suddenly. Why, did you know him? Everybody knew him. He had a walleye and his name was Rich William. He was also the pig killer and, well, he did other things as well. He had a gun, a hatchet, a spade, a pickaxe, and a contraption with bellows for smoking things out. I don't know what the smoke was exactly, poison fumes of some kind which he made himself from herb, herbs and chemicals. I only remember the smell of it. It clung around the barns, or wherever he'd been. You can imagine what my brother felt on that third day, the day he was leaving, when suddenly he smelled that smell. He was all dressed and ready to go. The bags were packed and down in the hall. Mrs. Driver came and unlocked the door and took him down the passage to Aunt Sophie, he stood there, stiff and pale, in gloves and overcoat beside the curtain bed. Seasick already? Aunt Sophie mocked him, peering down at him over the edge of the great mattress. No, he said, it's that smell. Aunt Sophie lifted her nose. She sniffed. What smell is it, driver? It's the rat catcher, my lady, exclaimed Mrs. Driver, reddening. Down in the kitchen. What? 
exclaimed Aunt Sophie. Are you smoking them out? She began to laugh. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, she gasped. But if you don't like them, Driver, the remedy simple. What is that, my lady? asked Mrs. Driver coldly, but even her chins were red. Helpless with mirth, Aunt Sophie waved a ringed hand toward her. Her eyes were screwed up and her shoulders shaking. Keep the bottle corked, she managed at last and motioned them weakly away. They heard her laughing still as they went on down the stairs. She don't believe in them, muttered Mrs. Driver, and she tightened her grip on my brother's arm. More fool her. She'll change her tune like enough when I take them up afterward, laid out in sizes on a clean piece of newspaper. And she dragged him roughly across the hall. The clock had been moved, exposing the wainscot, and as my brother saw it once, the hole had been blocked and sealed. The front door was open as usual, and the sunshine streamed in. The bag stood there beside the fiber mat, cooking a little in the golden warmth. The fruit trees beyond the bank had shed their petals and were lit with tender green, transparent in the sunlight. Plenty of time, said Mrs. Driver, glancing up at the clock. The cab's not due till 3.30. The clock stopped, said my brother. Mrs. Driver turned. She was wearing her hat and her best black coat, ready to take him to the station. She looked strange and tight and chapel going, not like, not a bit like Driver. So it has, she said. Her jaw dropped and her cheeks became heavy and pendulous. It's moving it, she decided after a moment. It'll be all right, she went on. Once we get it back, Mr. Frith comes on Monday, and she dragged again at his elbow, at his arm above the elbow. Where are we going? he asked, holding back. Along to the kitchen. We've got a good ten minutes. Don't you want to see them caught? No, he said. No, and pulled away from her. Mrs. Driver stared at him, smiling a little. I do, she said. I'd like to see him close. He puffs the stuff in, and they come running out. At least, that's how it works with rats. But first, he says, you block up all the exits eyes followed his to the hole below the wainscot. How did they find it? The boy asked. Putty it looked and with a square of brown paper pasted on crooked. Rich William found it. That's his job. They could unstick it, said the boy after a moment. Mrs. Driver laughed. Oh no they couldn't. Cemented that is. A great block of it, right inside with a sheet of iron across from the front of that old stove in the outhouse. He and Crampferl had to have the morning room floor up to get at it. All Tuesday they was working, up until tea time. We aren't going to have no more capers of that kind. Not under the clock. Once you get that clock back, it can't be moved again in a hurry. Not if you want to keep time, it can't. So, see where it stood, where the floors washed away like? It was then my brother saw, for the first and last time, that raised platform of unscrubbed stone. Come on now, said Mrs. Driver, and took him by the arm. We'll hear the cap from the kitchen. There's a little more for today, but what do you think is going to happen next? Share with your fellow listeners. But the kitchen, as she dragged him past the bay's door, seemed a babble of sound. No approaching cab could be heard here, what with yelps and barks and stampings and excited voices. Steady, 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 Cramp Furrow was saying on one loud note as he held back the rat catcher's terriers, which shrilled and panted on the leash. The policeman was here, Nellie Runnaker's son, Ernie. He had come out of interest and stood back from the others, a little in view of his calling, with a cup of tea in his hand and his helmet pushed off his forehead. But his face was pink with boyish excitement, and he stirred the teaspoon round and round. Seeing's believing, he said cheerfully to Mrs. Driver when he saw her come in at the door. 
Yes, seeing is believing, and we'll find out more about what happens to the borrowers in the next Pulse Pounding Edition.